Hi, this is Bob Wells here, and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. This is the show where we hear about people's interests and uncover some fascinating stories at the same time. I hope you enjoy today's show. Hello and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. In today's show, I'm delighted to be joined by Wendy Orr. Wendy was born in Edmonton, Alberta. The daughter of an Air Force pilot, she has since travelled around the world, including several years in Colorado, in France and England, where she studied occupational therapy. After graduation, Wendy settled in Australia, but she returns home yearly to visit her family. Wendy's many books for children have been published in 27 countries and won awards around the world. Prominent among them is Nim's Island, which was made into the 2008 film of the same name, starring Jodie Foster. A 2013 sequel, Return to Nim's Island, was loosely based on Wendy's book, Nim at Sea. Hello and welcome to the show, Wendy. Oh, thank you, Bob. It's lovely to talk to you across all these oceans and ethers. And <laughs> well, the good thing is we got the time right, didn't we? Because you're you're eleven hours ahead in uh, Eastern Australian daylight time. That's right. So it's you know just early evening or late evening, depending on how many grandchildren and deadlines I've had in a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's quite early here in the UK. Um, and, um, we just sort of, I say we're coming out of winter. It's still pretty cold, but I guess you're, you're going into autumn now. Yes. And, um, we've actually had a quite a, in some ways, a miserable summer here down because I'm quite far South in Australia. And, um, but you know, it's actually quite nice being cooler. Are you in the city itself? No, we're eighty kilometers south of Melbourne, and uh, so we're we're in five acres of bush. Oh, lovely! So, yeah, it, yeah, it is actually. Yeah. Really so you is. haven't got very many neighbours where you are. Well, it's funny because we're kind of on the edge of smaller blocks. So there's like five and ten acres and forty acres on one side of us, and then on the other side there's little house blocks. So for the first time in my adult life, I can actually walk to a cafe. That's all oh, that's there nice. is. There's nothing, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I can walk to a cafe. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. Yeah. Wendy, before we talk about your career as an author and your books, could you please tell us about yourself a little bit and, and your journey and then sort of what made you become an author, please? Well, I mean, I mean there's always mystery because, you know, I have two siblings, so they had obviously a very similar upbringing to me. Uh, but, I mean, no – no siblings, well, maybe if they're twins, but, you know, we don't ever have completely the same upbringing because I was the oldest and so, you know, life changes. Um, but my parents and um, my grandparents were actually all all readers, all interested in books. And so I think one thing is that although we moved constantly and I, I went to 11 schools between nursery school and, and year 12, Wow. Um, but the sort of constant was books and mum used to read to us <clears throat> and maybe there because of being the oldest of course I probably was read to the longest um, so I was probably about 12 when mum was still reading us bedtime stories and dad used to tell us stories he would sometimes read to us he would often read to us in a sort of crazy voice so he'd go Bing! very, very fast. And, um, <laughs> but then he would also make up stories. And we, wherever we traveled, we had stories about our dog Frida's great, 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 great grandfather who had, I'm sorry, the word dog. I've had to pick up a small one. Um, oh, right. <laughs> Frida's great, 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 great grandfather really was a kind of just so story. And so if we went through a tunnel in Switzerland, then that was because Frida's great-great-great-grandfather had, had dug it. And sometimes oh. Dad would actually just start laughing as he told it. And I think that sort of gave me permission to realize that you could just have fun with words and stories and just kind of make stuff up and, and be crazy. So did he did he sort of make the stories up as as you went along? 
Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. It was when Spontaneous. we were in the car. Yeah. Yeah, because we lived in France from, from when I was three till I was seven. So we, we traveled all over while we were there. And um, that basically, well, I presume not if we, you know, went into town or something. But if we were if we were actually traveling, there would always be a Frida's great, great, great grandfather story about where we were going. So it just made up as, as it went along. They didn't work written down. He tried to write them down later when I had kids. And, and they didn't really work. It was the fun of the telling. And, of course, they also really encouraged my writing and were always, you know, proud of what I'd written. And, you know, Mum saved all or certainly most of all my poems and uh various stories and you know so were you writing ever since you can remember i actually remember very clearly the decision because i say we lived in france and so i went to a french village school learned to read and write in french um when my parents each of my parents um were hospitalized at different times uh while i was you know in, in first two years of school and uh so i wrote to them in french uh, because I, you know, I didn't know how to write in English. When we moved back to Canada, my parents thought that um, they ought to get me reading and writing in English, and so they left to uh, Dick and Jane. Uh, I think they they were North American readers, but I think they're very similar to John and Betty. Um, they left these two Dick and Jane readers by my bed one night. Um, uh, this is while we were still in France, and I remember waking up and seeing these and picking them up and reading them, and the realization that I had read a complete story, and I'd read a story in my own language, and that was really, really powerful. And, and what was the what was the book, Wendy? Dick and Jane. I mean, they they were just terrible little readers oh, just, that we scoff at books. now. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes, they were. You know, see Dick run, see Jane run, see Spot oh, yeah. run. And yet they were a lot more exciting than our French readers. Uh, so they were actually a little story. And I think that was it. It was the power of this. And I really started writing pretty well as soon as we moved to Canada and, you know, started writing my own my own stories. And, and did you? How did you manage that with the schoolwork? Because I guess you know you'd have, been, you'd have had quite a lot of schoolwork, and then what? You, I suppose you did it when you got home, did you, or did you do it at school as well in English lessons? I think I just did it at home. I mean, you know, if we're not talking about the sort of huge dedication of time here. You know, I was probably a fairly typical seven-year-old. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if if my huge effort was probably sitting at this coffee table and writing for you know half an hour on a weekend or something I can remember the feeling of sitting at the coffee table but I have no memory of of sort of you know and you just long. enjoyed the process yes yes and and I used to write plays and things too um uh, certainly uh, for the first place or the second place we lived in Canada in the prairies and uh because I can, I would coerce as well as my siblings. I uh, coerce the other neighborhood children into acting in my plays. Oh, so you were a playwright as well. I was then. I haven't carried that on. Uh, you know, perhaps it's it's harder when you can't actually just tell people <laughs> that they have to act in your play, but you're going to get the best parts because, after all, you did write it. You so did write well, it, absolutely. Yes, so you deserve yeah. the best parts. Of course, of course. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting how you how you i mean it it, it sounds as though it was always there and, and with your, your dad's stories and the imagination and all that, that sort of incentivized you to to start writing stories it's quite interesting how you've become an author well yes i, I mean it was a, a very determined thing you know i mean when i was four i suppose like a lot of little girls i was going to be a ballerina um but I think, you know, probably luckily for me, I decided against that because I don't think that was going to be a great career choice for me. And so really after, 
you know, from kind of seven on, it was being a writer. But when I got to high school, secondary school, I, you know, I suddenly thought, well, how, how would you do that? You know, what? How well, in would terms you of in it? terms of earning a living, I guess. Yes, and I, I just the whole logistics of it. It, it just struck me as. Uh, just so kind of amorphous, I think, you know, that wh- what did you do? And I was, I went to a country high school on the east coast of Canada. Um, yeah. That's where I finished high school. And, you know, we certainly didn't have any particular careers advice, or we certainly didn't have visiting authors. And um, I, I just couldn't imagine that you could just go and try to write and try to make a living. Uh, so I just kind of gave up on that for a bit. What did you do after that? I really couldn't decide. So I, I liked animals, but I didn't want to spend seven years being a vet and, or, you know, studying to be a vet, uh, which it was in Canada. And um, so I did this animal care technology course, which was, I think I was, I think the, the first graduates were graduating the year that I started. You know, it was a brand new course. And basically, it meant that you studied for three years. And if you want to work with a vet, you would still only be paid, you know, like a high school student coming in to help. And um, and you could really probably look forward to a career in cutting up lab animals. And I... I kind of made a bet with myself that I would go to England for the summer and if I failed, uh, then I would quit and do something else. And this was a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy because I had unfortunately blown up the chemistry lab and I was told that I had to redo my experiment or I would fail. Was it a big explosion? No, not really, <laughs> but it, it was enough to, you know, fail that experiment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't um, what, what I used to get up to with my friends, was it, where you'd get the, the gas pipe um, and then set fire to the end of it. <laughs> No, this was probably just me muddling something. Uh, right. and <laughs> it was called the bomb calorimeter experiment. That's the only thing I remember about it. Um, but. However, I hitchhiked to the Air Force Base and um, waited to, you know, have a spare seat on a plane. And, um, yeah, so I got on a plane and went to London uh, the day I was supposed to redo my experiment. And um, surprise, surprise, they actually failed me, just like they said they would. I, I don't think I knew that could happen. And so I said, fine, I'll quit. And then I decided to do occupational therapy basically because a friend of my mother's um, who lives um, uh, near Windsor, yeah, uh, she was an occupational therapist and she was a superhero to me when I was a kid because she, uh, she came and stayed with us in Colorado and rode our horse while she had a broken leg and a long, long leg plaster cast. So I thought she was a superhero. And I think she, that so she was right. So sorry, just to rewind that she she had a broken leg and she was riding a horse. Yes, interesting. That's the sort of person she is. Yeah. So Very you can stoic. see, obviously, you know, I was twelve or thirteen when she stayed with us. You know, of course, she was going to be my superhero, and so I went to see her in London. She was kind of the reason I was allowed to head off to London on my own at eighteen, and um, I thought, well. If Shirley's an OT, that's what I'll do too. So I wow. stayed in London and went to the London School of Occupational Therapy for three years. <laughs> and I think planning's really been a big feature of my life. <laughs> it seems that um, you, you've taken some very good decisions there and obviously it's worked out very well with, with the books. Well, yes, it, it, I, I think I have just been somebody who's kind of, you know, Stumbled along and made spur of the moment decisions, and I've mostly been very, very lucky. So, when you were doing the occupational therapy as a career, did you still yeah. write? Um, 
Yes, not a lot because I, uh, I guess I worked for I guess I worked for four years before I had a baby, um, and that, that was all quite um, busy times too, adjusting to living in a new country and living quite far out on a farm and driving into work and actually kind of learning to drive because I'd had my license but I'd never driven, uh, so I was driving you know hundred kilometers each way and. There, there was kind of a lot to adjust to in Australia. Okay, so you, you'd gone back to Australia by this time? Uh, yes, basically I finished yeah. my final exams and um, worked for the summer at yeah. Edgware General Hospital. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and as soon as my results came through, uh, we went to Australia. I'd actually got married while I was in college because <laughs> because I'd met an Australian um while I was walking in Wales, or well, like sorry, not in Wales, but in Malvern. Oh yeah, yeah. And um, yes, yeah, so I married him a few months later. <laughs> As I said, lots of impetuous decisions <laughs> that have mostly turned out well. <laughs> yeah, I can see. I can see a film coming here. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, and then. Well, at what point did you sort of think, right, I want to get back into the writing and I want to do this as a career? Well, again, it was fairly um, impetuous. I mean, I'd had a little spell um, after I had my second child and we'd moved and bought our first farm. Um, I didn't get a job for a bit and... I thought, okay, I need to be serious about writing. But, I mean, I I sort of wrote a couple of articles that, you, you know, newspaper I sent them to didn't accept them. Um, and so I thought, oh, right, well, that's it. And and then I managed to get a job. And my children were quite small at this time. They were – well, I went back to work when my – when my son was nine months, but with my daughter I ended up waiting until she was 15 months – uh, so yes, obviously I did kind of put writing on hold while I had a three and one year old and was working <laughs> and farming, but there are always still things at the back of my mind. They're always just kind of constantly running stories. And then I was um, at work one day and I was crossing the road with a friend who was, you know, another OT. And she said, um, did I tell you I'd written a book? And I, I, I kind of thought, I mean, oh, she'll have written something very kind of academic and, you know. Um, so she'd actually written the first three chapters of a Mills and Boone romance. And she had been asked to send, send in the rest, which is actually quite an accomplishment. Based but on I, three chapters. Uh, yes, uh, that's how... Yeah. Um, that that's how often publishing works, and certainly with the romances, whether it's a very strict formula, uh, they they get people to you know you send in the first three chapters, and then they decide they want to see the rest. So that I guess that gives the writer an opportunity to think. Well, they like it. I'm going to invest time in it, or I'm not getting any response. I'll think of something else. Is, is that the idea behind it? I think basically they don't want you to send in the whole lot. Which oh, they're not right. going to read anyway if they don't like. Well, of course, if they don't like. But I suppose what I suppose what I'm saying is, would a writer sort of j- just write three chapters and send that in before they completed the book, or would they complete the book and just send three chapters in? I think a lot of people do. Personally, I would always want to finish a book before I sent yes. in the first three chapters because certainly for me, the first three chapters are never going to be anything. The, the final version of the first three chapters is not going to be anything like the first three chapters that I would ever write of no. any story. Um, and so I guess it, I guess it's how much you're prepared to back your judgment and how how much time you feel and which is why it's actually good to have another income when you're writing because, you want to be able to really take that time. Oh, that's what I think. You know, just take your time, work out what that story is, work out how those first three chapters should be. And 
you know, don't just submit something. No, so it take, takes the pressure off a little bit in terms of your income. You're, you're earning, you can live, and then you can spend time investing in, in your thoughts and development of the book, I guess. Very much so. I mean, you know, I, th- I think that pressure, you know, deadlines are great for actually making you finish something, but in general, I, I don't think that real anxiety about money and pressure to to earn I, I don't actually think that benefits creativity. No, no. So you, men- you mentioned that your your friend um, was had been asked to sort of send the three chapters in, and um, she was then commissioned to write the rest of the book. And that that led to you sort of you were going to say that I think that that led to you wanting to do your own book. Yes, I mean, you know, I, I feel very kind of egocentric, but my 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 sort of instant second thought after sort of, well, I wonder what amazing thing she's written, um, was, well, when am I going to do that? I've always yes. said I was going to write a book. And and so I was I was actually doing a, a course on um, sensory integration therapy and I really enjoyed doing it. A friend of mine had just been doing her master's and I thought, I don't really want to do that, but I really did want something else as well. And so I thought, right, as soon as I finish this course, I'm going to start writing. And I I literally uh, sent off my last assignment on Christmas Eve and and I started writing. I always say on January 1st, but I suspect it was actually January 2nd. (laughs) Um, But... I, I started writing and I spent a year kind of experimenting with what I wanted to write. And this friend and I um, shared a subscription to a, a writer's magazine. And of course, I mean, we were a long way. We were a three to four, yeah, that far. I guess we were a good four hour drive from Melbourne. Uh, so, you know, there was no kind of interaction with you know, other writers or writing groups or, and, and this is um, 1986, 80. Oh, so pre, pre-internet. Very much pre-internet. You yeah. know, I mean, a phone call to Melbourne was a long distance call and, and we were farming with two small children and I was, I was working four days a week. Um, we didn't have money for long distance phone calls even. No. So, uh, you know, it was quite isolated in that way. And I just kind of threw myself into what I thought I wanted to write. And I just tried, um, I started an adult historical novel. I think I wrote some short stories. Oh, of course, I tried a few romances because obviously they would be easy. And that is just such arrogance. I had never read a Mills and Boone. No. But, you know, how hard could it be? Well, really, really hard if you've never read one. When you wrote these stories, did you start them off and then perhaps did you finish all of them or, or did some of them, did they did they sort of fall by the wayside while you had other ideas? I think I finished all of them. Yeah. Um, you know, and then polished up my first three chapters and sent them off and they, they finally told me on the third one, they said, you do not have the magic it takes to write Mills and Boone. Oh really? And yes, that's very honest. It, 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 I mean, it may not be honest, but I mean, that's how. How did you feel when they said that? <laughs> oh, devastated, furious. Yeah, I bet. I bet. You know, um, and and, and this is what I mean about the arrogance. I really don't think that you can write things that you don't like. Now, by then, I had read ten. My friend gave me a stack, and I read them, but I didn't like them. No. And so I kept trying to make improvements, you know. So I wrote my own version of how I thought they should be. Well, that wasn't actually the formula that they had worked out sold very, very well. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, and my husband said, well, if you're going to fail, you might as well fail doing something you like instead of something you don't like. 
And was he very supportive throughout your writing yes, career? Yes, he was. He was. Uh, and he was yeah. sort of very indignant on my behalf if people didn't like Good. my work. But, yes. you know, he knew that I wasn't enjoying these. It was just that I thought – I think my plan was, you see, I would write these romances. They would pay – stacks of money, and then I would be able to cut back my working hours and write what I really wanted to write. So it's a great plan if you actually were writing something you liked in the first place and therefore could do it. But I mean, you don't want to use your creative output doing something you're not enjoying. And the point is, lots and lots of people love them. So they should write them. You know, it, it's, there's nothing wrong with, with them. It was just something that actually I don't particularly enjoy reading and therefore I'm not going to enjoy writing. At what point did you decide the type of novel that you wanted to write? Is it something that, did you always know what you wanted to write or, or did it come to you after trying out different stories? Oh no, I still don't really know. I, I mean, oh, right. so very still an experiment. much. Absolutely. Um, And, you know, all the writing advice is, you know, like, you know, your market and, um, you know, you know, sort of where your niche is. And and this is probably really good advice. I mean, my agent said once, if you had stuck to one genre, you know, you'd have, you'd have dump bins, which is such a horrible word, but you know, those stands where one person's work is in a bookstore. Um, but I've tended to sort of find a story and then I've worked out how I want to tell that story. So, which means I've jumped sort of from picture book to adult, to young adult, to, you know, junior and jumped all around. Yeah. And, and that's just made me happy. But at the end of that first year of experimenting, uh, there was a competition in this writing magazine for a, the text of a picture book, you know, without any pictures. Yes. And I, like a lot of people, had always presumed that I couldn't work on a picture book because I really can't draw. And I thought that that the art had to always be with the words. But uh, that's not true. If you want to write a picture book, you write a picture book. And the illu- the editor will match the illustrator to your words. Oh, I see. Yeah. And, uh, and which is just not, you know, you always sort of picture, oh, they're working together. You know, you could imagine yeah, them in the yeah. same room. And no, it doesn't really doesn't work like that. That's, that's what um, I would have um, expected. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I think it's and, – and I mean, I think the reason we think that is because the picture books that stick in our mind, it feels like that. You know, they, yes. they, they're they just wedded and you can't imagine it. But that's, of course, part of that is the editor's skill of, of saying, well, Wendy, now that she's drawn this beautiful thing, you really don't need this little description here. You know, we take that out and just kind of rework this to – not to match the pictures, but just no. to let it flow. Yes. And and so although this was my first attempt at a picture book, my children were um, four and six, I think, when I actually wrote that text. So I was reading picture books and had been reading picture books aloud for six years, you know, several a day, and I used very simple picture books at work as well um, because I was working with some developmentally delayed preschoolers. So, you know, they they were just sort of in my brain. And so I was lucky enough that it actually won the competition and the prize was publication. Oh, fantastic. That was your first publication, was it? That was my first publication, Amanda's Dinosaur. and. It was such a wonderful experience. And yeah, when I, I first saw the illustrations, it was just so exciting. And, and what sort of age group was that intended for? It when? was very much a, a 
standard young children's picture storybook sort of for three to five-year-olds, four to yeah. six-year-olds. Yeah. Yes, quite, you know, just a, a simple story of a child wanting a dinosaur, um, which, you know, was something that my children were always wanting. And um, But it just worked. And it, yes. it did actually did quite well. It was in print for about 20 years, I think. And, and it was sold um, all around the world, was it, Wendy? No, it wasn't. I think it um, – I don't think it sold in the UK except um, – uh, it, 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 there may have been some selling through the Australian branch, but it was published in, yeah. in, um, in the US and in Canada uh, with, and I guess this, uh, with this the was- Scholastic Group. And this was well pre. Still, was this still pre-internet and pre-Amazon and all the rest of it? Oh yes, so it was. So people would have to go to bookshops. You had to actually go to a bookshop, or this was uh, Scholastic, and I don't know if you have Scholastic in the UK, um, where they do school book clubs. So you. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, uh, this is probably something similar, but you know, the yeah. child t- brings home a little catalogue, and you. Well, obviously, you don't have to buy anything. Oh, excuse me. Yes, yes, I have seen them. My, my children used to bring them home. Yes. 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 A little book so, and then you choose one. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so it's very exciting. And, um, yeah. you know, you actually reach a lot of kids that way. I mean, it's it sold huge amounts in the States. I, you know, I think I probably made a cent a copy, but it um, mm. it did sell a lot which is kind of mind blowing when it's you know your very first thing and really understanding in a different way that these words and stories you've thought of and they're actually out there people are reading them it's quite humbling what was your sense of accomplishment like it was really really exciting and yes but it was quite humbling as i say i i went to a a book fair in Melbourne and um, got all dressed up and apparently you go to those in jeans, but anyway, um, a child came up and recited the whole book to me. Oh, wow. Incredible. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, I still feel quite almost tearful when I I think of that moment. You know, it had only been out a month. I can Um, see how you you felt quite humbled for that. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's, That's amazing. And I think this is the feeling that goes on, you know, when you get the letters that say, your book changed my life, your book saved my life. And, you know, my books don't save anybody's lives, you know, really. But they, obviously, sometimes my books touch something in someone. It's just the right time for them that, that they've, something makes them feel some sense of hope. When times are really bad, and and it's not always the books I expect. No, and and I mentioned in the intro, and just just for listeners' benefit, um, a majority of your books are for children, teenagers, and young young adults. Young adults. Yes, and really, the majority are now just classed as uh, a middle grade fiction, um, which is kind of kids from. Eight, I think it's sort of eight to fourteen. Yes, in, in that age range, because all of these things have changed over the thirty years I've been writing. So that things that were called young adult when I started writing are now middle grade. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, no. So by far the majority of my works have been in that that um, eleven year old maybe. And that initial success that you had with your first book. Um, that must have spurred you on to to write more and have more success. Oh yes, yes, and um, it, it was it, you know writing is a very very difficult game, and it turned out that the publisher actually was not very keen on the book. You know, it was like one editor really loved it, and and the publisher was you know fine, but. Um, he didn't like anything I submitted after that. And I, it, there were very rocky couple of years. You know, I kind of thought, wow, I've got a book out, you know, and it's actually done quite well. I mean, it didn't win any awards or anything. But, 
you know, it actually sold quite a lot of books. Yes. And, well, yeah, and everybody was, well, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, When's, where's the next one? <laughs> well, yeah, but we don't actually like your next one. And it's, publishing's always in a state of flux, but it was in a particularly difficult state of flux at that time. So there were, it was twice when I submitted a manuscript to a company and and the company changed hands by the time the manuscript was read. Um, so there were a couple of books that were accepted by an editor and then the company changed hands and either the editor lost their job or in one case the um, that company had a book that was very, very similar. Well, you know, like filled a very similar niche. And that was actually true. You know, I saw the book and um, – it really did. And I submitted some to Thomas Nelson, which was originally an English company. And it was a trade publisher, which is, you know, a publisher that goes into bookstores. Um, but by the time the manuscript got there next, the following week, it was an educational publisher. And that's quite different but they, they took quite a lot of my books over the next few years and then changed editors and threw them all out um, and then asked for three, four of them back again. Yeah. It was really quite traumatic, but at that stage I was still working. So, you know, I had that backup. But it, by, by the sound of it. Writing's not for the faint-hearted, is it? It's not. It's a really, really tough gig. And I know we say that yeah. about a lot of things, but, it, you know, it it truly is. And um, I guess it, because it's you uh, rather than a company, you know, you, you, mm. you're the one that has to sort of field it all and, and you've got to be able to sort of, like I say, be quite sort of thick-skinned in terms of rejection, just sort of knowing that actually you do have something, you've had success before and you'll have it again. Yes, and obviously, you know, we all doubt that, you know, and, and, and our resolve and, and doubt sort of seesaw back and forth for, if you, for most humans. Um, but, I mean, I, I was lucky again in the end. And one little book I, I sent off to HarperCollins and the editor who had actually commissioned my Amanda's Dinosaur in my first, in that competition, um, she had just moved there and right. she liked my work. And yes. so I stayed with her for about seven years, I guess. And then I think she moved companies and then I moved companies. But, you know, it's it sort of things worked in the end. But, yes. yes, you have to be prepared for a lot of rejection. Jumping forward. And forgive me if we're going to miss some stuff out, but we can always go back to it. Nim's Island, <laughs> um, very successful, became a film, Jodie Foster. Tell us about that. Uh, look, that was just the loveliest experience, the whole thing. And Nim's Island is actually a, a story that came from a story that I wrote when I was nine, I think. Uh, and when I wrote it again as an adult and – it the the plot bears very little resemblance to the story that I wrote when I was nine, except that it's a, about sort of well one child in in my nine year old story is two children, yeah having to fend for themselves, particularly the little girl. Um, the way that I reached back to that story, there was more the feeling of who was the nine-year-old child who wrote it. And once I connected with that on about the 12th draft of this story that I knew I really loved, that was just dead on the page, that was when it came to life and became Nim's Island very much as, as it is now. I think yes. that the next drafts just changed very little. It, it sold to, I think, seven countries, um, uh, you know, on its first publication, and one of those was the U.S. And it was uh, Los Angeles Times best, you know, in their best book list for yes. that year, two thousand and one. 
which means that it was in a kind of a shiny new cover um, on the library shelf when a woman walked in to get uh, some summer reading for her son, her eight-year-old son. Yes. And, uh, you know, she liked this shiny new cover that nobody had picked up before, so she took it home and started reading it with him because it was just a bit hard for him and two weeks later wrote and asked if she could um, sell the film rights. Wow. So it was just a really lovely experience. We became very close friends, um, probably partly because when I first got her email. This is directly uh, from Jodie Foster, was it? Oh, no, no. This was from the producer. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. So she was an independent producer. I mean, Jodie's foster son also kind of came into it. It was the first well, that, book. Yeah, that, that, that's why I said did. that, because when I did the research, it mentioned she, uh, mentioned about Jodie Foster's son and the book. So I, I put two and two together. Yes. Well, yeah, fair enough, because it, um, yes, she, I think he read it when she was deciding on the part. Yeah, yeah. And um, he really loved it, and she said it was the book that got him reading. And he oh, actually great. then read it to his younger brother. But it must so, have been fantastic for you when, when you when you got that initial contact saying that they'd be interested in doing a film. Oh, it was fabulous. One thing that mm. I didn't know was, was that basically the letter she wrote to me was really kind of, I'm planning to buy you a lottery ticket. Um, and <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> because she was an independent producer, Paula Mazur, yes. and – so what she was actually offering was that she wanted to pitch to studios yes. to, to make this. Um, and apparently, you know, I don't, I, I've never heard any statistics, but, you know, it's like a million to one that you're actually going to get a movie from that point. And, um, but I just had perfect faith. Yeah, of course she would. And, and I think we became really close friends because when she first wrote you know, I rang my agent. My agent wasn't in because, of course, this is still landlines then. I guess we had we had mobiles and cell phones, but, you know, not for sort of practical use. We didn't anyway. Um, and, of course, I couldn't wait till the next day for my agent to ring back. You know, <laughs> So I wrote back and said, so I'm pretty sure we haven't sold the film rights. Then I forwarded it to my parents, you know, Mom and Dad, look at this. Somebody wants to make a film. And, and, and she wrote back and said, well, I think the one to Mom and Dad wasn't to me. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think at that point she either had to decide I was a total idiot or we became friends. So um, yeah, for the next five years we we really worked together Uh on this film, even if I was just kind of cheering in the background, and um, and then the whole experience of seeing it filmed was just unbelievable. You know, it's just these people that had lived in my head well for yeah. uh, eight years then, and I mean, apart from the initial story from when I was nine, but and all, there they were in real life. It was incredible. That sounds really magic, Wendy. Because you know, yeah, you wrote the story. You thought about the whole thing. It was inspired for it when you were nine. You wrote it later on, um, but you didn't write it as a screenplay or anything like that. And then, and then it just came to you. Fantastic. Yes, that's it. it was, and and then I, I actually worked on the first draft of the screenplay with with Paula Mazur and uh, the screenwriter Joe Kwong, and I learned so much from them about about structure and. Uh, just uh, just a lot of of uh, of things about story and how it works and it was just fascinating so that helped you in your future writing i guess heaven knows you never know what helps right. or not sometimes you you know sometimes i think oh it's better when you stood back with a bit more instinct um but i think it does i think all knowledge always helps even if you you know sometimes overthink things <laughs> There's a lot of, um, I mean, I know people who've been to see films and they've read the book and there's always a sort of, oh, yeah, it's better than the book or mm, wasn't quite the same as the book. What, what, what's your view on ter- in terms of how the, the film turned out in comparison to the book? Well, the, I mean, there were some changes. Um, 
because some things just have to be translated differently because it is such a different medium. So I can tell you something and sort of I say that the volcano exploded or the storm came and so this is what it is. But when you have to show it with real people, sometimes things have to be a little bit different. Uh, well, I, in, in, for example, we haven't really got the budget to make an earthquake. <laughs> yeah, actually, it was amazing. Uh, I would that that is always a big problem, and certainly that happened with the second one. Um, the budget just kept kind of growing, and in fact, we were able to have everything that I had. It was more in the sense of a reality. Uh, so when I have, if I have her crossing the ocean on a sort of like a tiny little tugboat and then a tiny little sailboat. Um, that's just not so realistic, you know, when you've actually got real people and, and showing a real ocean. And yes. so they, you know, they used like a bigger ship and that sort of thing. Um, and then some things, you know, just have, well, visual appeal, I guess, even if it's not what I might choose. And yeah. Yeah, there were a couple of things that I wouldn't have written in that way. But, you know, overall, it was, I think it was actually very close and, cool. and and totally got the feeling. Yes. So in terms of the follow-up film, um, Nim at Sea, did, did you write Nim at Sea specifically as a, uh, you know, the fact that it could, it would be a book, but also a film? No. Um, and I think that was good, actually. I had yeah. always wanted to write the sequel. Um, I'm not sure that my publishers were really going to let me, uh, you know, because the book did reasonably well. As I said, it sold quite a bit overseas. But whether it sold enough for a sequel, I'm not sure. But once we knew that there was going to be a film, then they let me go ahead with the sequel. Yes. And... Um, so I actually wrote the sequel. The sequel came out actually just as filming started um, in Australia. and it, it, it came out in the States when the movie came out. But, um, in fact, Paula had just arrived for the filming and was going to launch the book, except yeah. she literally got stuck on a boat in the mud oh, right. and didn't make it to the launch. <laughs> Oh. It just seemed such a wonderful sort of, you know, bizarre thing to happen for a book called yeah. Nim at Sea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't write that, could you? That's uh, No, no. But, but it meant that Nim was still my Nim. I didn't have any actors in my head when I was writing it, and I think that was no. really useful. Yeah. So you, you've got an adult book called The House at Evelyn's Pond. Yes. Yes, and now we were we were talking before about how we met through my cousin in England, who I met quite recently or found out about quite recently, and, yeah. and that's quite strange because uh, the house at Evelyn's Pond is entirely fiction, using places that I have known in my life or lived in my life, um, but it turned out the there was a bit more mystery than I knew of. And I did have relatives in England. And um, when I met Tim's father, who was my uncle, he asked why I had written about uh, White Waltham Airfield. Yes. And I, I said, well, simply because there was so much information about it on the web that it made it a very good place to set um, my protagonist, who was flying for the um, air transport auxiliary during the Second World War, and 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 then she becomes a war bride and moves to Canada to Nova Scotia, where we had lived briefly. And John said, "But I've flown from there, sort of like kind of I think he said sort of all my life, which, yes. which I guess is probably a slight exaggeration, but um, he had." So I think he trained there, and um, 
and then had also flown out of there uh, with this wonderful group of men who took old pilots and one of, you know, just for joy rides and things. Um, and one of them took me around when, when I went to England long before I met any of my English family. Um, and that was quite amazing because I'd actually had a quite a terrifying dream of flying over White Waltham. And it was terrifying because I felt like it was so real and that I didn't know where it was. And then I found it in a book afterwards. Um, and so it was quite surreal actually going there after having written about it. I, I bet it was. And just for listeners' benefit, um, Wendy mentioned Tim. Tim is a an old friend of mine, school friend initially, um, but still friendly. Uh, still friends, and um, Tim is Tim put me in contact with Wendy, and that's how that's how this interview uh, came on. I and mean, you heard you heard Wendy there talk about John. John is Tim's father, so uh, it's an, it's interesting how we were introduced. Well, I think so. I think life is full of amazing mysteries all the time, and and all this thing about six degrees of separation. You know, sometimes well, you think, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's kind of how it is. It, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and like I say, with, with the research I did, I, the house at Evelyn's Pond, what, what type of reader would that appeal to, um, Wendy? Well, apparently it's women's fiction, which always to me sounds really grim. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think it, it's, I suppose it is three generations of women. Yeah. Uh, so did you write and- it specifically for, for women? No, not at all. But then so I never could, know who I'm writing for. So have you have you had uh, feedback from from any men that have read the book? Oh yes, yes, yeah, and yeah. especially from some, of course, some of the men. I interviewed a lot of um, ex World War Two veterans um, doing this, and luckily they were all very flattering about the book. So I mean, briefly, what it is is the uh, I think I really think she's the protagonist, but anyway, the the oldest character who is this ASA air transport auxiliary pilot, um, and then her Canadian navigator husband, and of course they they meet and they go back to his farm in Nova Scotia, and um, but then the Australian that the Canadian daughter meets. So everybody thinks it's autobiographical, except it's actually really not at all. No, no. <laughs> um, but he's got a father who was in Changi. So I, um, yeah, I interviewed a, a lot of men, which was just so, uh, well, obviously sobering. But again, I felt very honored by the stories they shared with me. Um just amazing, you know, what people go through and, um, yeah, and just the generosity of spirit that people would, would share their stories with. It was, yeah, really quite touching. And and those those stories sort of inspired some of the stories within the novel, I guess. Oh, very much so. Um, yes, at, at one point I felt I was really patchworking a lot of of different different stories, you know, but um, yeah, because I think once these men have shared things, you had to. Yes, that, do you know what? Now, now that you've mentioned and told us a bit about that book, and we've got rid of the women's fiction um, thing, I, I'm quite inspired to read that. It sounds really interesting. Um, I know we're sort of moving around a bit, but with your huge body of work, um, we'd be here all day, I think, talking about it. But I'd like to talk about the the Bronze Age books or book. Uh, the one I, I sort of researched was Cuckoo's Flight, which, again, is is appears to be for young adults, but um, sort of takes place in the Bronze Age. Um, and I guess you must have had to do quite a lot of research, historical research, to actually, you know, bring that to life. Well, I did, and it was just so fabulous. And I was um, 
I'd, I've been fascinated by that period, I guess, since I was about 10. Um, yes. Just mythology and uh, and then, of course, reading Rosemary Sutcliffe. In fact, I always, I mean, as a child, I decided that I was, um, uh, that I had once been, I was a reincarnation of a, a Roman Roman British soldier. Um, <laughs> what you, you had, you, that's how what you felt you were? That's what I decided as a child, yes. Oh, okay. And I, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I'm not really a great believer in past lives, but at 10 or so, that was my decision. Yeah, and yeah. I really thought that I would sort of kind of grow up to uh, write history about Roman Britain, uh, really very much following in Rosemary Sutcliffe's footsteps. And I do still have um, a you know, a long novel that I wrote when I was about 12 and 13. I expect my mother take me down to the, uh, that was when we lived in Colorado and, and would go to the Air Force Academy uh, military library and and take copious notes. Um, anyway, so I'd had this sort of period and then at some point I just, oh, this is embarrassing, but I actually had a dream about a priestess, which is nothing to do with any of the books, but for some reason I decided uh, that I needed to research and I started researching uh, Minoan history. That's interesting. And this was actually 30 years ago that I started researching it, so it was just yeah. all on interlibrary loans and, um, uh, you know, any books that I could find, really. Yes. A- and then... The book that was really had really been in my head for a long time, about 10 years ago, I decided I really did want to write it. And the problem was that I always heard it in verse and I thought it was too complex to do in verse. Yeah. And I just woke up one morning and I thought, well, what if I do it half in verse and half in prose? And I... um emailed my editor and said, um, what do you think? And I really, I honestly really thought she would say, don't be ridiculous, nobody's done that. Now, it's not true other people have done that, but neither of us actually had knew that at the time. Um, yeah. And she said, well, why not, you know, give it a try. And so that that was Dragonfly Song in there. That took a lot of drafts because I, I did, well, I guess it took a lot of drafts before that point. Um and that was still done just with sort of research by now on the on the web as well. Yes. And then because that book did very well um, in terms of awards, unfortunately it didn't sell to the UK, although it's available um, like through my publisher does sell into, into the UK. Um, and so I actually got a grant to travel to Crete and um, Santorini to see the sites of Akrotiri on on, on Thera Santorini and, um, you know, see the archaeology in Crete, which was oh, wow. just phenomenal. And by then I'd yes. um, really kind of made pen pals with an archaeologist in Crete and who basically once she decided I was serious – just threw herself into helping me. And she went off and did experiments for me. You know, she dived to get a um, a murex shell and dyed a silk blouse with the dye from it. Um, That's going above and beyond, isn't it? Oh, she was just <laughs> incredible. And yeah. so when we went there, um, unfortunately, she was having chemotherapy um, and she wanted me to stay with her. Yes. Uh, but it was just too risky when we had just traveled. And um, so I just spent one incredible day with her and then she just kind of directed all the rest of our travels. We're probably the only people who ever went to Crete and never got to the beach. Um, we went around this site um, in Gornia, which she had actually um, excavated, I mean, with other people. Yeah. and But she had also built like an experimental house uh, and she cooked me a, a Minoan meal. And wow. We went on to uh, some unexplored 
well, unex- unexcavated sites that she had found. Yes. It was just just mind blowing. It was it was overwhelming. It was just wonderful. And Crete, so Crete is was- sorry to interrupt. Crete, Crete is um, an amazing place. I went there for a holiday a long time ago in the early eighties. We landed at um, I think it was Herisonisus or Heraklion was it was the airport. And I yes. just remember we we hired a um, a car or a jeep as it was because. You know, with the roads at that time, probably still the same. You know, you you drive along, there'd be a crater about two metres wide. You'd have to drive <laughs> round it. Was it like that when you went there? Well, the main roads that we went on were actually not too bad. I think I felt like the, the main road that we took out um, to Gornia was actually, I think it was quite new. It felt like quite a highway. This was some and, time ago, but I, but I do remember the... Um, you would come across relics and, and it seemed very, very untouched since many thousands of years before. Unbelievable. Just walk around and you just pick up bits of pottery yes. and they're, they're 4,000 years old. It's amazing, but, isn't it? You know, we, we climbed up this, um, the sacred peak from Heraklion. And so it's, I don't know, five kilometers away or something. Yeah. And there's uh, now a a radio tower on top of it, and so you can't actually get into where the temple was. But she said to me, "I'll just you know just have a look around because I actually found a seal stone. You know, one of those little carved stones that were sort of used like a bit like a signet ring." Then, yes. Um, she said, "I actually found one there, and of course, you know, you have to hand it in if you find one. Um, yeah. But there's lots of bits of." pottery and and I mean it was incredible we we couldn't sneak in through the fences because they're actually working on it yeah but all around this outside wall there were just bits of pottery everywhere and then coming down the hill um I found quite a big piece which unfortunately I think the very helpful German tourists who directed us down this path probably just stepped on because it was just neatly broken in half then but it was um, it was actually a glazed piece. Most of the pieces you find are just unglazed and just like accidentally fired when something has when when something was torched, as you know most of the buildings were. Um, but this was actually a glazed uh, ritual piece. She thought, and uh, I very cleverly was sure that I could read uh, or not read, but see the Minoan uh, linear B writing on it and she said no that's actually just from you know sort of four thousand years of being pushed down the mountain and she said but there is a thumbprint oh wow and uh, i mean it just gives you goosebumps and i sort of said where and then i felt it and i you know my thumb fitted onto it Uh, i mean and you have that connection with somebody who lived four thousand years ago and they made this pot and they slipped as they did the glaze and the thumbprint stayed in the glaze. It's- yeah, and you're, you're the first person to sort of touch it since then. So, Wendy, you did, you did this research in, on Crete. Um, that must have really helped you write the book. Oh, yes. And, of course, it changed things. Um, the character in the second book, Swallows Dance, was going to be a, a seal stone engraver. And I just felt that I would, you know, go to the museum and I would see the seal stone that inspired me. And I saw many beautiful little seal stones. But once I had found that piece of pottery and also once I'd walked on the floor at Gornia of a, of a pottery workshop, which was still soft, after, you know, it had been excavated. The, it was about, I guess, two metres of, um, of dirt on top of it. So and but when they excavated down the she said you know we know this is the potter's floor because look here's the, the soft clay still on the floor and so obviously she had to be a potter um and so of of course it just influenced it also it took me a while to get into writing it because I I feel like I had to obey things a bit more, having seen them in real. Also, 
going to Santorini and actually going to Akrotiri, uh, from what I had read, you know, they'll say, oh, well, kind of everybody escaped because they haven't found any bodies in Akrotiri, which, of course, it was where the um, volcano on Santorini dumped 90 metres of ash. The, when we got there, we were told the archaeologists are saying, no, we haven't found any bodies yet. And they weren't, you know, people weren't in the the city maybe. But nobody on that island survived. Oh, right. And yeah. I found this, I actually couldn't write for about three months when I got back. Uh, I found this so overwhelming that everyone, even obviously I had to get my immediate protagonist off the island or else there was no story, but everyone she knew would be dead. Um, and I just found it really overwhelming. And so it's, it's interesting sometimes when you're just, you know, playing with your imagination, you think you're going deep. But then when you see the evidence that, you know, this earthquake, which had probably moved people out of the city, and then this ash and the the, the toxic cloud, um, you have to really deal with it. And it, it's quite deep and painful. So, so that shaped the next two books because then I, I wasn't ready to give up. And Cuckoo's Flight that you mentioned actually – it is a sequel to Swallow's Dance, but a sequel with a gap of 70 years. Um, so, because I, I wanted it, it was, I didn't want to follow on in, in a neat way. I'd like to just talk about writing itself, Wendy. Hmm. Um, you've obviously been doing it all your life, you're very, very experienced at it. Um, how long is it, how long on average does it take you to write a book? About 18 months, usually. Um, you just have the one on the go at the time, do you? I used to have more. I used to be able to balance more, and I, I'm not sure. Um, I think some of it is that I was writing shorter books and working on more picture books. Picture books are really hard, and I find they take a very long time. I mean, one of mine took 20 years, but... Obviously, you do many other things in between, um, whereas, you know, the Minoan novels were all about 70, 80,000 words, between 60 and 80,000 words, certainly in yeah. their first drafts. I think yeah. they probably all ended up about 60, 65 yeah. um, in, in the final print. Yeah. Um, and what did, you, what, what did your working day look like when you're writing? I, I tend to sort of check my social media and emails as soon as I get up and and, and then I walk the dog and then I, I like to think that I then in a very, you know, regimented way, I, I either just do the urgent emails and, and then get on to the book. But, of course, you know, life is messy, but that's the general aim. And then I uh, like to be actually writing certainly by 10. And and I often write through to I mean I stop for lunch and um you know like everybody else I work from home so I put on the washing and you know wander around sometimes and if it's really nice sometimes I urgently have to go out to the garden to think but I, I tend to work through till about four when I walk the dog again and then I I sometimes go back and work a bit after dinner although I. Yeah, I keep trying to do things like have weekends off and never work in the evening, um, but it doesn't always work. I suppose it very much depends on what you've got going on in your head in terms of, you know, if you, if it's flowing, why why would you want to stop it? Well, yes. And, of course, there's, there's a lot of it, though, that is um, editing. <laughs> I'm saying that because I've just done editing, you see. And so when, whatever you ask a writer, it, it sort of probably depends on which stage they're up to. So I've, I've just had a book go to the printers, although it will come back for final proofreading. Um, and, of course, when you're editing, I find I can actually work more hours 
but it's not so much about flow. Uh, it's it's puzzle solving. And uh, but yeah, I mean you do. <laughs> You know, you do have to spend a certain number of hours actually in your chair and doing it. You know, you can yeah. walk and get inspired and all that, but in the end, you actually have to sit down and write the thing. And I'm, I'm told that, that there's two type of authors: they're, they're the plotters who have have to sort of have the plot all written out and they expand on it, and other people who just sort of fly by the seat of their pants and, and sort of have a rough idea and they go along and there's some people in between. Where where would you put yourself, Wendy? Oh, well, I saw a chart on this the other day, yes, because um, plotters and pantsers, as as in the seat of the pants. Um, and, and what did it say? I'm, I'm something like the, the the mad pantser or the, the planning pantser. So I'm kind of halfway between. Right. So what yeah. I have to do is is I have a pretty good sense of the protagonist Um I have a pretty good sense of the place. Possibly possibly location is one of the things I have the strongest sense of when I start. I have a very clear like movie scene, if you like, of a crucial scene. I know the first line and and I know roughly how it ends. And once or twice I've been wrong about how it ends. So I have to know all these things and then I start. But I I now, I've actually written a synopsis a couple of times. This is an amazing invention. Um, well, I think, yes, my publishers decided that when you go to, when they go to the marketing, the sorry, the acquisitions meeting, yeah. where they actually decide whether or not they're giving, going to give you the um contract to write the book, uh, that it would be good if they had a synopsis. I used to just kind of write it and then tell my publisher about it. And now I figure if I'm going to invest, you know, a year or two of my life that probably I should get some kind of um, <laughs> reassurance that there might be <laughs> something at the end. Yeah. Uh, and I've actually found that it is really helpful to write a synopsis, but it can't be too detailed. I need to just have general ideas and be very aware that it's going to change. At some point, especially maybe in the second draft, but sometimes partly within the first draft, I do actually do rough plotting and and jot down the scenes from now till the end of the book. I mean, I did that first when my editor said, well, is this, is this deadline feasible? And that was with Dragonfly Song, which I was sort of feeling at that stage. I would just actually write for the rest of my life. And my first reaction was, no, of course I can't have a deadline. You know, I'm never going to make it. And then I I sat down, I wrote out all the scenes that I could see from now till the end of the book. And I said, oh, yeah, I can do that. And so it's helpful as long as you don't get stuck on on following that scene just because you thought it was going to be there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I suppose it's like a foundation. You put your foundation there, but it can, as you're building and constructing it, things can actually be moved and changed, and um, or new things could come in. But you've got a rough idea. Yes, and you know they'll change more in the second and third and twenty fifth draft too. Um, right. Though hopefully yeah. a bit less each time. So, what would you tell someone if we've got any listeners who are sort of thinking, "Well, I really would like to write a book. Um, I've got something in me, but." for some reason I keep procrastinating. What what would you tell someone who's interested in becoming an author? Well, if you're actually having trouble starting, one of the things that I do and, and seems to work for a lot of people is set a timer just for 10 minutes even. Um, I, yes. I mean, I think 10 minutes is just fine. And pick up a pen mm -hmm. Just write by hand, yeah, not on your computer, and um, and just write for ten minutes. And you're not allowed to stop. You're not allowed to criticize. I mean, yes, if you immediately see that you want to use this other word, then just fine, scribble it out, write the other word, but don't stop and criticize. If you want to go on, 
after your timer goes, of course you can. But that just kind of gets you going and you say, oh, yes, I can, I can start. Um, I wouldn't necessarily decide that I have to write the new book, the, the, the idea that you're kind of reaching for. Maybe that's still too much pressure. So just you still just put it aside and do the 10 minutes. And then when you've done it a few times, maybe then you could say, well, all right. Actually, I could I could actually just put something about it in this ten minutes. Just just write anything, so like what you did what what you did yesterday or something like that. Absolutely, yeah. Just yep. to, just no to get, get get your brain and your your pen. It's interesting you should say um, with a pen rather than a keyboard. Well, I think that when you're in that stage where you're not sure about what you want to write, you're not sure of yourself. I think that for doing an intense bit of writing practice, the, the, I mean, there is like there's lots of neurological stuff that happens between the brain and the and the hand, which is slightly different from the brain and the hand touching the keyboard. Although I, you know, really you're still using your hands on the keyboard. Um, mm. However, there is definitely a different con- connection, um, and so I find that 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 writing by hand connection is what kind of gets you into the psyche of it. Uh, I find that once I'm writing prose, once I'm on my way, I can write onto the straight on to the computer. Oh, but you start Um, off, you start off writing by hand, do you? Usually. Yes. And anything in verse. So all the Minoan novels were written mostly by hand. Yeah. Um, And then the prose bits often on the computer, but often they were actually written in verse first and then they were transposed into prose on the computer. Yes. Uh, but I, I, but each book sets its own rules. So the, the, the one that I, has just gone to print, um, some bits were written by hand, but it only needed to be started and thought about and the rest of it was, you know, perfectly happy to go straight onto the keyboard, and it was all in prose. Yeah. So each book does have its own rules. But if you're stuck, go back to the hand. That's very interesting. So what um, current up-and-coming projects and books have you got coming, Wendy? Well, I presume I can mention this because apparently it's at um, Bologna. The Bologna Children's Book Fair is on at the minute. Just I think yeah. it started today. Yeah. And um, – uh, so it's honey in the valley of horses, which is really kind of going back to Nim's Island after my very. So this is a new one, honey in the valley, horse, no valley of horses. Yes. So I have, yes. you know, um, so it hasn't been sold anywhere yet because it's oh, right. yes, just fresh and new, and it won't be out in, in Australia till August. Yeah. Um, but but very much going back to that more Nim's Island world. I told my editor it was Nim's Island with horses, um, and it's it's probably slightly older, darker than Nim's Island, but I think it's a similar feel. It's just magic realism, I suppose, rather than fantasy, and very much born from the pandemic, um, but but only in the sense of a family. Going into another world, yes. Um, uh, but I think during the pandemic, and and in Melbourne we had uh, because I count as Melbourne, even though we are actually <laughs> like miles from anywhere. Um, so we were locked down for a very long time, and overall it was it was about eighteen months, I think, and. Yeah. And for a lot of that time, we could only travel for five kilometres, which when you live five kilometres from from any shops or anything, so say we can walk to a cafe, but of course it was closed. Um, so we, I was very aware of, of children not socialising and especially as I, so we had, um, we had two grandchildren living with us well, and their parents luckily. Um, but, you know, we had a 10-month-old and a, nearly two-year-old when when they arrived and they lived with us for a year. Um, 
And then the other two grandchildren who were the same uh, same age, uh, of course, we didn't see at all. Um, so I was just very aware of all of these things, but also a real fear of, a real worry about children's fear of other people. And I guess I, to some extent, made, was making this a metaphor um, of, of this family who get trapped in a in a valley with these magical, wonderful horses. But, yeah. you know, at some point you have to leave and get out into the real world. Yeah, of course. And so that's that's coming out in August. And and you you mentioned that you've you you've just been doing the editing of another one. Is is that the, is that the, is that that book or, or is this another book? Yes, this is the one I've just been editing. Oh, okay. Okay. So they take it to Bologna. They take books to Bologna. Um yes, when they're not quite finished, which is kind of daunting. So it hasn't hasn't had a final proofread, so you know. And um are you working on any, any new new books at the moment? No, I'm. St- I, I mean, I literally finished editing this last week. Oh right, yeah. So I'm, and and then I had to do my tax. Oh right, which yeah. is not my forte. <laughs> um, <laughs> you prefer words to numbers. <laughs> I do prefer words to numbers. Uh, yes, when yeah. when I watch, you know, um, nine out of ten cats do countdown. I um. I don't actually do the numbers. I just do the no. words. <laughs> it's been fantastic talking to you, Wendy. Great to hear about your books. I'm going to put the links to your website on the show notes. Oh, thank so you. So they'll be out on all, all the podcast platforms. Where can people reach you if they, if they want to contact you? Well, I do. I have a contact me button on the um, on the website on the. Yeah, on the contact page. It probably That's wendyor.com. Wendy yes, yes. Yeah. And yeah. and I've got uh, the, the kind of usual social media, you know, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And so you can always always find me there too. And, um, you know, I as long as people are nice, I always answer them. Oh, that's great. Well, it's lovely talking to you. And good good luck with your book in, in August, Wendy. Thank you, Bob. It was lovely talking to you. Thank you. You have been listening to Undercurrent Stories. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share the show link to your friends and family. And if you have 60 seconds, I will be most grateful if you would please rate and review. To hear more episodes, please subscribe to the show and visit undercurrentstories.com. If you leave your email in the link, we will notify you as soon as new episodes are released. Also, check out our social media links, details of which can be found on the show notes. Until next time, this is Bob Wells wishing you all the very best.